Today is the 24th of July, 2023. Yesterday was a special day. I hope you enjoyed it. It was 23 July, 2023. In case you forgot to enjoy yesterday, there's always today. Guten afternoon to you. How are you? Hi there. Is this what they say to each other in in New York? In, in, no, they don't even Hawaii. bother to say hi because that's a waste of time. <laughs> so how would you like start the interaction with um, somebody else? How would I start an introduction with somebody else? Depends on yeah, if, you don't, if you're not going to say hi, I mean, what would I say? What would you going to say? Saying, if, no, if I was with somebody that was in New York, generally they live a lot faster than they do in Texas. So in New York, they would just start saying what they want to say, like, okay, today our episode is about heroes. Let's get with it. They would just immediately start. They, they wouldn't even bother to say hi. Why should they bother to say hi? hi? They're busy people. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's the same here in Moscow because it's fast paced, crowded, and uh, also expensive. Expensive. And also it's, expensive. It's, yeah. it's expansive and expensive. Uh, but, you know, we feel that we want to say hello. We want to go ahead and just full send out a full greeting hello <laughs> to our subscribers. Thank them for listening. You know, a lot of people are sweating. A lot of people are, uh, a lot of people are staying home. A lot of people are having floods and rains, and uh, some people are working from home. Some people aren't even working. Um, you know, it's it's a big world out there, and um, you know, we're all just struggling to stay alive. Yeah, yeah, but but in New York and in Moscow, we got a walk fast unlike you in texas you're probably relaxed and chilled but, no but, we're not you know, we're because, dri because, we're, no? We're, we're driving fast we have guns in our cars we're drinking and driving we're smoking we're texting we have our bluetooth on and we're mad as f-u-c blah, blah, blah. So I, I, I thought that'd be kind of dock of the bay uh, no, 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 no. It's, it's like record high temperatures day after day after day. People are uh, passing out on the streets. I'm not, I'm not joking. They're passing out on the streets. There's ambulances going around picking up homeless people who were waiting in bus, little bus, you know, covers when you wait for a bus that they've passed out. So they've opened mm -hmm. cooling centers where people can go to recover if they have heat stroke. Uh, um, I, I only go out if I absolutely have to, like I had to go to the dentist and I almost passed out and I didn't bring enough food with me or water. It's like crossing the desert. Um, my, my apartment's air conditioned, my car is air conditioned, but I have to go from my apartment down the stairs into the car. The car is at 101 degrees. You can't even get in it. You open the doors for it to cool off, but the air outside is hotter than the air inside the car. Then you drive for 10 minutes in construction and heat and everybody's mad because it's so dang hot. And they look at their phones to see that the heat's going to continue for five more days like this. And then it's going to be the end of July. And the real month when it's hot in Dallas is August. So really the swimming pools a lot of people are not even going to their swimming pools they pay for these expensive apartments and lofts and they don't even go to the swimming pools because it's too hot the water is like uh soup it'd be like getting into soup well that that, that it, makes sense that makes makes sense but uh i i don't know uh, you ever been in a situation with um uh, when uh when you kind of stopped at the red light, at the traffic light, and uh, and then the, the light turns green, right? And people beside you just honk at you as uh, just two milliseconds passed, but uh, they start honking oh, at you. No, no, they don't honk at me because as soon as it turns 
like it's red, I can perceive when it's going to be light red and I already start moving. So in Texas, people are very impatient. And uh, if you are a distracted driver, which means you're texting or you've got your Bluetooth on or your wife is calling you or, you know, your boss is calling you, there's quite a few accidents um, because we, I think, because we have all this technology and we're very distracted. And um, no, I am. Can I, I, can, I just, can I just can I just say how uh, how much I, I hate the impatient people? I hope you're not the one. <laughs> yeah, no, no. It's the thing is, is that I live on the east side of Dallas where the lake is and there's a lot of beautiful homes and there's a lot of people who work downtown. They live in Lakewood. And so they're zooming to work thinking they're going to get there. And, uh, you know, they're impatient to hurry to get to work to finish it so they can waste time at work so they can get back home and drink. That, that is kind of like the philosophy of Dallas this summer. It's, you know, people are still going into their offices. They're still going into their schools are going to be starting up again. But um, I don't know, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a wild world here, here in Dallas. And um, if you go to the lake, there will be people riding bicycles leisurely. There will be people, uh, lesbians rollerblading there's some rollerblading clubs there are some people on these bicycles where you lay down on the bicycle and kind of row with your you you press you push the pedals with your feet but you're kind of laying down have you ever seen those bicycles you're laying down on the bicycle it's about a foot off the ground yeah yeah but but they're dangerous to my view because my opinion because you can't you can't really see them because they're so low to the ground they you can drive them over um if they suddenly unless they're on the water right you're talking but, about but bicycle on asphalt well yeah no people uh there are some guys generally guys that have them and they use them to ride around the lake in and the lake has very good protocol there's a uh, uh, little signs up to explain to how how to announce that you're coming around, how to stay in your lane, how to walk without like messing up the bicycle people. So when you go to the lake, I generally like to drive to the lake, even though it's only like seven minutes away, get out of my car and then walk up a hill or take some photographs of downtown. But if you can get out of the city into the lake, you know, there might be some people having a picnic or there might be some people photographing an eagle who has just built her nest there. So it's, it's kind of relaxing. Uh, I mean, unless you run into David and the, the, the bicycles that, that people, yeah. you mentioned the bicycles, are they ridden by mostly by men or by women? Well, Dallas is run by blondes. It is run by women. Uh, there are different clubs. There's there's like mixed bicycling clubs that are guys and girls. There's uh, you know a couple that might be out bicycling. There are there are guys. There, there's a lot of guys that are in bicycle clubs. So yeah, yeah, but but, but the bicycle which you you actually like relaxed lying on your back, right? That, that's more convenient for men. I think that I thought that probably be a man kind of sport. Well. Those guys are not fierce. They're lazy guys. They just want to lay there and like, <laughs> I don't know. I've seen these, the the bicycles that are, you lay kind of on the bicycle. It's about a foot up off the ground and you're just are leisurely pedaling. But I guess I've mainly seen guys on those, but they're not going very fast. They don't want to go fast. They just want to just lay there and pedal. But yeah. but there's you know a lot of people laid, around. laid by laid back bicycle right. laid back bicycle guys who smoke weed, <laughs> but not in the park. You know, I mean, because you know you're not supposed to be doing these things in the park. But uh, yeah, it's beautiful yeah. around the lake. It's beautiful. A lot of people go there. I mean, right now it's very very hot, so people are going early early in the morning. So you'll so you will see people up at like six o'clock 
you know, 630 with their cup of coffee, jogging and running or riding bicycles, because by eight o'clock, it's going to be so hot, they might as well just go to work and sit in their air conditioned building. So sometimes people are going in early to work because it's just so hot. But when we get to October, it's very pleasant to go to the lake, you know, the falling leaves and everything. So our goal is just to make it to end of September, which is the beginning of the Texas State Fair. And life is good again if we could just get to the end of September. Do you have a, a seasonal goal where there's a certain month you're trying to get to where life will be more calm? Well, when life will be more, more calm, yeah, I think the summertime is great because everybody's uh, dispersed. I don't know, mostly because the school is over and uh, kids go to, uh, I don't know, and people go to take Holiday. vacation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge city, overpopulated uh, mostly. It becomes more or less livable. And I like it there. About how many people live in Moscow? 12 millions, give or take. Same as New York, I guess. How many people live in New York, do you think? Uh, too many? I don't know. Um, and in New York, a lot of people go to upstate New York uh, on vacation, or they'll go to, you know, France or Italy, or they'll go to this leave New York. They go to Germany. They just leave in the summertime, and uh, but then other people want to come to New York, so a whole bunch of people come to New York. So it, you know, like New York is just kind of always full. And in Texas, you know, because there have been uh, riots and protests, and like France is all messed up. Um, France lost a lot of tourist traffic this summer because of all the violence and demonstrations and burning cars and burning buildings. But, you know, a lot of people went from from the United States that I know of. There are some people who went to Turkey on vacation. They went to uh, Florida on vacation, even though there's some political nonsense going on in Florida. You know, the hotels in Florida offered a lot of specials because they knew that there were quite a few Americans that didn't want to go overseas. So. You know, there were a lot of hotels that had specials. A very good friend of mine, Haley, brought me back a T-shirt and a journal and some just a bunch of cool stuff from Miami. She went for four days to Miami and the airplanes are having specials because they know it's the, the end of the summer. Like you said, kids are going to be going back to school soon. So they're trying to catch that uh, end of the summer tourist trade. But basically, I'm just sitting here. I'm sitting here in my air conditioned apartment wearing sweatpants. Uh, why am I wearing sweatpants? Because my air conditioning is so cold and it feels good to be wearing winter sweatpants. It makes me happy. <laughs> no, not to change the subject, but, but you got, well, we're sitting, sitting here talking about that. What's the biggest, what is the biggest city you, are, you have uh, like ever been to? either Manhattan or Istanbul. How, how many people live in Istanbul? Well, they're all over because they also have these things called Gece Konduk. Gece means night. Konduk means put it up. In Istanbul, if you can put up a shelter overnight, you can own that land temporarily. So there's Istanbul on the Asian side of the Bosphorus, there's Istanbul on the European side of the Bosphorus, Bosphorus. but Anatolia, the, the central land in Eastern Turkey has quite a few, quite a bit of poverty. So a lot of people come to Istanbul, also Ankara, and they'll just bring a few things and you know, if you can afford an apartment in Istanbul, it's like who can afford an apartment in Paris? Who can afford an apartment in Rome? You know, swanky apartments are always expensive, but these Gece Konduks, Gece means in the night, Konduk means you're going to put it up. If you can just, you know, some people have built little overnight shelters near trash heaps. Like there are places where all the trash of Istanbul gets carried away and they make a mountain, then they like put some soil over it and they say, 
oh, this is mountain number 104. But in Istanbul, there are there are many, many people who want to come to that city for city services and opportunities and jobs. So when they do the population count of Istanbul, I don't even know how they do it. I don't know if they do it door to door. I don't think like in Dallas, they do it door to door and online. But these gadget conducts are like just sprawling all over the place. So there's thousands and thousands of people that are not in the actual population count that are also in Istanbul. Well, it's a it's a complicated times politically wise, but uh, but but it's good for the exchange rate. I, I remember you told me a few of your friends visited Turkey last year, I guess, and it was quite affordable because uh, Lira lost, I think, fifty percent to U.S. dollar last year. Maybe I'm mistaken, but I I don't remember. And um, yeah, and and I liked it. Uh, just um, it seemed to be rewarding in every way, affordable, as I said, uh, compared to places like you you said Paris or London or NYC. Well, you know, uh, the pers- I know two people that went to um, somebody from France, Vladimir, went to Cappadocia for a hot air balloon ride. And he was very frustrated because he couldn't get flat white coffee like they make in Lyon, Lyon, France. So he was not happy, but he went on his hot air balloon ride and he had a few days off from the fires and drama in Lyon. And also uh, my daughter and uh, her son and then my son-in-law, the lawyers, they went into Istanbul for like two months this summer. And they had a great time because they are basically Manhattan lawyers with Manhattan salaries. And they're in Turkey where everything is dirt cheap. So they were just there. They just got back about a month ago. So, you know, it wasn't a problem. Like, if you have a lot of money, you can do a lot of things. I mean, there was also terrorism and uh, collapsing buildings. But, you know, if you just kind of work, I'm not joking. You know, uh, soldiers on the streets with AK-47s. Uh, the airports had police all over the place. But you know, if you don't if you don't mind police and armed soldiers on the street and collapsing buildings, Istanbul is a great place to visit. Yeah, yeah. I and you said that they were from Manhattan. I thought, uh, like, uh, I've seen a few TV series, TV shows about uh, about big law firm and. Uh, I'm thinking that if, if you live in Manhattan, you visit Turkey for a month, would you even want to go back? Because is it worth living in in New York City, working at a big law firm with all the high taxes and crazy cost of living, when you can just enjoy it somewhere in, uh, I, I don't know. Uh, well, I mean, I just know that my uh, daughter and son-in-law moved from New York to Dallas, and they just bought a house here on the other side of White Rock Lake. And... Um, I don't know, you know, I'm I'm briefly looking at the population of, of Istanbul just, just quickly. And you know, it 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 this this you know, Wikipedia whatever says it's the world's fifteenth largest city. And they just are reporting, I don't even know, like fifteen million residents, but that's not including all these other people. But what I'm saying is like, if you are a lawyer and you're living in New York, well, you have to have, your firm has to pay you a salary that can compensate for everything. So it doesn't matter what the tax rate is because you're working for Sullivan and Cromwell. If you're working for Sullivan and Cromwell, that's the number four corporate uh, firm, you know, and they send pound cars for you and they, they have a, they have a private gym and like, there's nothing you can do wrong. If you can st- keep your job at Solcrom, you're set. And you only have to borrow $90,000 against becoming partner. And then you're like set for life. And you're, let's say you're 34 years old. So I'm, I'm just saying that um, the opportunity, and also New York is fabulous. There's little small places where you can live. You can live in Park Slope. It's just like living in a cute village with green space and libraries and museums and people are out walking their dogs. Or you, you, if you wanna 
I mean, you can do business in downtown Manhattan and you can live in Brooklyn and there's great little restaurants and there's like, you know, the movie Staying Alive with the Bee Gees and John Travolta and like he's walking on the streets of Brooklyn and he's got this girlfriend who's from the Bronx. There's all these different neighborhoods in New York. So if you live in a neighborhood and you shop and work in the neighborhood, you don't have to go in into the city. Or one of our subscribers, Teshwan Glover, he's a young man in Newark, New Jersey. And that is just a 20 minute ride across the Hudson River into Grand Central Station. So within 20 minutes, he can be in one of the most fabulous cities in the world. And um, I don't know, I like to visit New York, but I, I don't know about it's, living it's a there. Personal, it's a personal question, I understand. I'm just, uh... You, you know, I, I told you that I've been to Germany, to, to Great Britain and to, to the US, but mostly I'm kind of a shot in. Do, do you think it's it's weird uh, to not have the desire to travel? Because I've never been to Turkey. I have never been well, to don't St. Go. Petersburg. Don't Turkey. go. Don't go. <laughs> Why? There's guys with AK-47s. There's, oh, no. there's it's not that they're shooting and everybody's visiting. It's that just keep them in hands. Uh, but, but lots of tourists from Russia are going to Turkey these days. They actually, they've always been a very popular destination. Uh, the Turkey it's always been. Uh, but but I'm talking about my myself because everybody seems to like to travel, uh, and I am. Um, I feel I'm thinking, is it is it weird to not even have such a desire? No, I don't think so because travel isn't as fun as it used to be. Airplane travel is exhausting. Going through customs is exhausting. Waiting at the airport for your canceled flight is exhausting. I, uh, my friend David Anton and I have been talking about there's so much in Texas to see. He likes to do little road trips like, you know, go to Port Aransas or go to Galveston, go to the Hill Country. So I think exploring your own country in your car is kind of nice because you've got your cooler with you you've got your drinks you can turn your radio on there's not a whole bunch of people mashing against you trying to get in line to check in their suitcase i don't think travel is what it used to be i mean can you remember 10 20 years ago traveling was exciting and fun yeah i'm i'm, I'm with you traveling has become exhausting to me uh yeah before 9 11 i think that was uh more or less okay after that, all the security check, they just drive me crazy. Yeah, and um, you know, for me, I have, uh, I mean, I like to visit cemeteries. There's fabulous cemeteries all over the Bosphorus. There's fabulous cemeteries in Paris. Like I love cemeteries. Those are like some of my destination. I, mean, I love to go to cemeteries. There's beautiful ones on the Bosphorus and there's Père Chaise in Montmartre. But my, my personal family of origin is mainly buried in San Antonio, and I have not been back to San Antonio since before the pandemic because they've been expanding the highways, and the Texas highways and freeways are getting bigger and bigger and faster and faster and more overpasses and more bridges. that like, right now, I really would not want to drive to San Antonio because I'd have a dang anxiety attack people like motorcycles zipping in and out like it's very it's even highway travel in texas unless you're going on some back roads or some country roads has become somewhat uh aggressive and exhausting so i don't know you know it's 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 just i get tired just being alive i don't mean that in an in, impolite way i'm saying just i have time and i have some money i could go on vacation but right now, I was talking to my friend Alex saying, why don't we do a staycation? So I don't know if you're familiar with that term, like you live in a city, Moscow, or you, li you live in a city, Dallas, or you live in a city, Portland, and you just find some like amazing house where someone's renting it for the weekend. And you just go and you just, you pay up front and you check in and the food's already in the fridge, the drinks are there, they have beautiful views. You pretend like you're not in the city that you're in and you just zone out for two days. And you don't drive, you get an Uber to take you to a club or you don't even go to a club. You just stay at home and <laughs> stay at home and drink. When I mean stay at home and drink, I mean 
you know, have like a, have a nice drink or like look through a magazine or, you know, play your guitar. So I have some friends who have been on to this idea of staycation. You're staying in the same city. Now you have a summer house, so you can go there and kind of chillax and unwind. But I don't know. They say the airplane travel is down. Uh, the trains are crashing into each other and falling off the track. So Amtrak is not so much fun. It's I mean, just I'm uh, actually, yeah. lots of people traveling. I, I know a few of my acquaintances, they, uh, they just... Uh, can't seem to believe in one place and they i think they're trying to they tell me i need to travel because i have to sort of like find myself but uh, i don't think they're traveling to find themselves because it seems like they're actually trying to escape themselves to escape that part that's of true. their life that they don't like um yeah I no know. that's um, that, yeah no i think that's true because sometimes unhappy couples will go on a vacation and expect the vacation to fix the marriage and then they whatever they took with them on the vacation is what they experienced there like arguing about the dinner arguing about the room and i don't know my screen just went dark what does that mean the low battery i, I don't know oh, no, 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 it, no, it, no my phone just my phone got tired no it's fine no, I mean, there are different reasons to go on vacation. For me to go on vacation would be, I don't want to have to hear the hammering, the drilling and the construction of this eight story building they're putting up next door to my apartment. I, I can go on a staycation just to get away from the dang noise. So I'm not going to find myself. I already found myself. I, I'll have a book, couple books with me. I'll have some nice things to drink, you know, maybe I'll watch a movie without having it interrupted by they've sent the bug spray guy to my apartment because some bugs are coming in from the heat. I guess for me, it would just be to find some peace and quiet. But what about for you? I'm thinking about that story we read a while ago uh, by Ernest Hemingway. Um, he was like white elephants. White elephants. Oh, yeah, yeah. Hills, like white elephants. Yeah. yeah the, the story was about abortion. Sadly, it is so it was. They, they, it's never mentioned, but you and me, we know. And uh, uh, yeah, the couple was traveling, the Americans were traveling through Europe, I guess. And uh, I don't know what they were trying to do, either find themselves or uh, escape from themselves, but uh, wh what do you think? How would that end for them? Because uh, did she, did she get an abortion eventually, or, or well, or I just it? know that Hemingway was an American and he lived some time in Florida, and he was fond of setting his stories in Europe. He had been an ambulance driver, and the expatriates they leave their patria, their country, and live in another country where it's more fun, it's more cheap, it's more glamorous. So Hemingway himself and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Gertrude Stein and any number of Americans left the United States to vacation and live in Europe. So this idea of a man and a woman in Italy, they're on vacation. Um, it was also when women were first, you know, starting to to use birth control more, but that wasn't always working. So in that story, Hills Like White Elephants, they're an American couple, they're in Italy, and their amazingly decadent life, decadent, you know, for the purpose of our subscribers, just means you're eating and drinking and dancing and staying up all night and eating and drinking and dancing and buying expensive clothes and eating and drinking and dancing. So it's it's a decadent life and the decadent life was very popular, especially if you had some money and you were surrounded by artists, musicians and writers. So in that story, their decadent life was interrupted by the inconvenience of her pregnancy. So they weren't like a couple that was like just trying to get pregnant or they were ready to settle down. In that story, the way it's told, you know, she's kind of ambivalent about it. 
And he's like, yeah, I'm, I'm totally going to love you after this. Like, let's, can we just like get on with this? Oh, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're in love. Don't, don't worry about it. Like he never specifically says that, but he's definitely going to get back to his life once he takes care of this business. It's like your car broke, you're going to go get it fixed. And I just, yeah, when I yeah. read that story, I've read it off and on a couple of times over the years. Um, I think that he's going to just um, get back to his life. And I don't really think they're going to stay as a couple, but I think that they went ahead and uh, got the abortion in a city where it might have been more safe. So maybe they were vacationing on the coast and they, they're going to go into a city where there's a better hospital. So they go and they take care of that. And, and then, you know, I don't think that their relationship is going to be the same. It's not like, going to get your car fixed and once you pay for the car repair you just go on about your business so the way i've read that story over the years i just have a feeling that they're probably not going to stay together yeah we we we, we are bitching about life now and then uh but imagine that uh how how did people like couples that love each other maybe novel noble couples how did people in the past not get pregnant because i've watched that show game of thrones but tudors i, I don't remember what time yeah. was it and uh, you and um yeah I, I i don't know how it seems like they had lots of sex but uh just a few babies well, born I, I don't well, know. Well, you know, um, babies babies were given away, or sometimes girls were sent to a convent to ha have the baby and give it away, and the nuns would raise it. So sometimes, uh, if a girl was pregnant, and this was also this also happened in the deep south, uh, uh, a, a nice young lady from a proper family finds herself pregnant, and the family wants her to get married to a rich guy. But you really can't do that if you're pregnant because guys don't want used material. So the family might send the girl away for seven, eight months to a convent or a, a girl's home. And she has the baby there and gives up the baby for adoption. And then she comes back and she's all cute and she's all happy. And then people say, like, well, where would your daughter go? So, oh, she's on vacation staying with an aunt. And so in Southern hospitality, like, you know, Alabama, Mississippi, you know, Louisiana, wealthy families who had plantations, you know, the young men would play golf and they would ride around in their cars and girls would sip mint juleps on the porches. Sometimes these wealthy families would just send the girls away, like in the 1920s or the 1910s or even today. They would just send the girls away for a while. And that happened quite a bit in Europe. Or people, women would just go get an abortion. They just like get the guy to give them some money or something. They go off and have an abortion. So there's many, many people, uh, you know, girls I went to school with, you know, you just get an abortion because it's convenient and it's not super expensive and you want to finish your education. So you just, you know, just go take care of that. You may or may not even tell the guy like, Sometimes telling the guy can be like annoying because like he might have different ideas. Well, you mentioned a convent and uh, I, I know I have my existential crisis, perhaps, but uh, have you given any thought because I have any thought to uh, like join a monastery or a convent? Uh, uh, oh, forever? yes, I love it. I have had a long. OK, just briefly. The earliest forms of birth control, including abortion, are found in ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia as far back as 1850 B.C. I, I so, like, they've been doing birth control is. there. And then also, you know, Margaret Sanger is kind of the mother of the, uh, you know, of, of like, you know, the, the birth control pill. But, you know, back to the convent, I remember when I was in a Catholic school for a while. In the summertime, you know, your parents would send you on this little retreat. So you go away for three, four days and you're 
with all these other little girls and you're staying in this kind of nifty place and you're going to mass and you're eating together in a cafeteria and singing songs. And then these nuns would come and talk to you and you're just sitting there like, you know, maybe you're like 12 years old or like 11. And like I'm on a, this was very, very common and it still goes on. Uh, I'm just sort of there and this nun who's kind of like nice and sort of friendly, has a great voice, is talking about vocation and about how God calls us all to some special you know, mission in life. And I'm just sitting there wondering, like, when's lunch? And then she says something like, some of you might be called to become nuns. And then she just gently says, how many would you are thinking maybe to become nuns? Just raise your hand. So like I'm just sitting there thinking about lunch and looking at my shoes because I'm like 11 years old and every, some other girls are raising their hand and I figure like, well, I better cooperate so I can get to lunch. And I just raise my hand and then, you know, the nun does a head count. This was back when nuns would wear the black ha habit and the, like a white forehead piece and they didn't wear makeup or anything. but. I guess when I was about 11, I thought, well, that might be fun. Like, I don't have to be around my family or my annoying family, and I can stay with these, like, nice people. And there's a big library there. I thought, yeah, I'll become a nun. And then as I grew up, I actually like to visit monasteries, and there are some monasteries where you can do, like, a staycation. So... Uh, when I got my divorce some years ago, one of the first things I did was buy a new car and go on vacation with a friend of mine. We drove from Houston, Texas to Pecos, New Mexico, and we stayed in this uh, Benedictine monastery that would let you work, do like work study. So you can work and they'll give you your room and board for free. So my, my friend, Verna, she did gardening and then they wanted me to work in the publication house, but I didn't want to. So I signed up for gardening and kitchen duty. So I enjoyed cooking and eating. And I kept thinking like, why do I want to go back to Houston and work as a professor? Like, maybe I should just join a monastery. Have, have you ever thought of joining a monastery or being a priest? Not a priest, but monk. I don't know if there is a difference or not. Uh, I also was I always wondered how is it like Tsars, you know, Tsar the leader of Russia, they, um, uh, a few of them, I don't remember the names, but, uh, um, you know, in, in the time of their final illness, they um, were accepted to be a monk. How do I put that into words? Uh, just, uh, yeah, they converted um, and decided to. Yeah, a monk, a monk is somebody who generally withdraws from society to spend some time thinking and praying. So monks have been traditionally associated with withdrawing from society. And in Turkey, Cappadocia is filled with these beautiful churches that were carved on the inside of this soft rock. And there's, there's mural and fresco paintings of monks that went into the desert to yeah yeah but i was but i was trying to say about monks who like they were regular regular people but they retired to monastery at the end of their lives and become monks during their final illness because they knew there is nothing for them in, in store anymore that they're gonna die in a week or, or maybe less in a few days so they become monks to make their peace with god probably securing maybe. easier route to heaven Yeah. Yeah, you know, maybe. Uh, but, you know, you can be a monk out in your dacha. I could. Sometimes I fantasize. So what if I have this uh, place where, which is not, I mean, hopefully, if it's not too late for salvation, where, I don't know, it's very personal. I don't want to talk about that right now because it's just Okay, offensive. well, let's not talk about it. So the no, word no, let's, mones, let's, let's talk about it a little bit more. No, no, uh, what I want to talk about is the, the history of the word monk. The etymology is the history of the word. So in Middle English, monasteri comes from the Latin word monasterium, from the late Greek word monasterion, which means the hermit's cell, where you live alone, 
and um, you know, you, you're you're living alone because sometimes even living alone can be very busy. Like think of all your thoughts and all your desires and all your sins and all your yeah, I guess being a monk I don't, is. I don't, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know what living alone really means. Do you mean that there are no people around you, or you just sleep alone, or, or you don't talk to anybody? Well, the monks. A lot of the monks had girlfriends, because you know men are men. But I'm saying, well, that's you know, nice. like like the big city, Dallas, New York, Paris, Moscow. So we're surrounded by people at times. People on the subway. People in the cafes sleep people in the elevators like sometimes it's nice just to get out of all these people and get in your car and go for a drive even if you're commuting like i like being in my car but i don't i can't be by myself all the time so i sometimes like to go to a club or go dancing or be with people but i i think the interaction between being with people and being alone is sort of a pendulum that goes back and forth like sometimes you probably like being at work and going to the gym and seeing people. But sometimes you're just maxed out on it. It's like, I just need to get away from all this and you just kind of want to be off on your own. I think that's very normal. Tell your friends that. <laughs> your friends who want you to travel say, I'm working on my pendulum, my back and forth between wanting to be with people and wanting to be alone. Right now, I don't want to be with you, so I'm going away. Okay. I don't know. What do, I mean, I don't know. I just, uh, you know, my friend David lives in Dallas. He works. He's very busy. He's got a lot going on. He's got kind of a high end job. But he went on away. He went away this past weekend to Port Aransas, probably like about a four hour road trip. When he was there, his aunt and uncle were having a birthday party, so they all cooked together and ate together and sat out on the patio of the beach and watched the moon and just enjoyed being with family. And then he got back in his car and drove back and his truck. And now he's back kind of exhausted, but you know, back at work. So yeah. I just think the back well, and forth motion is, is probably. The best probably, solution. I, 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 I don't know. know. Actually, I, I told you before, it. I feel weird for a couple of days when I uh, am alone. Actual solitude is slightly scary or creepy. I don't know. But but uh, I spent many evenings every weekend. I spent it at my dacha and with nobody else around. And uh, But I'm always connected, if you know what I mean, because all this internet and phones and computers, uh, I don't think it's qualify if it qualifies for for being alone. I do love it, though, when I find myself there. Even there's a well, power you know, outage, or I forgot my laptop. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. No. Yeah, I, I, um, I think we have become very, very used to our certain connections, like, uh, you know, talking to a certain person a little bit every day, or finding out what somebody's doing, or, you know, like, I like to know what's going on in Portland, but sometimes they have power outages or like a tree falls on something and the road is down and, you know, or, you know, Manhattan is now covered in smoke and smog from fires in Canada. But, you know, I have, I have another friend, Jared and the philosopher truck driver guy who just had a little grandson and he was so sweet to send a little picture of his new grandson, whose name is Winston and kind of like Winston Churchill. But, I, I'm not uh, super close to Jared, but it's just nice to know, well, you know, he's okay doing his thing. And I think, uh, like, I keep my place pretty quiet because <laughs> there's so much noise outside. But I do like, I do have a little bit of an anxiety attack when I turn off my phone and I tell myself, I'm not going to live online. I'm not going to check in with all my couple of communities I have on me. We, I'm just going to be in Dallas. And I'm going to have one hour by myself in my car at the lake. And maybe I brought some coffee to drink. But as soon as I get there, I want to take some pictures, post them to people. So, you know, it's a struggle. It's a struggle to be, um, you know, to be alone. Or you had said that there was a bakery on your way out to where you have your summer place. You said 
that it was so nice to go into that bakery. The bakery smelled like warm bread. And I go, can you take a picture of the bakery? What did you say when I said, can you please take a picture of the bakery? Yeah, you, yeah I forgot about that. I, uh, yeah, you better write I that down. <laughs> but, but I sent you another picture. Uh, it was a local club, not the club, I don't know, cultural center, community center. I don't know how you call that in the U.S. Yeah, it looked very much like what you have in Dallas. Yeah, I did see that picture. I I think uh, I think we should use that as our as our uh, cover shot and just call this episode "Travel," because we're really, <laughs> not really on the topic Ooh, of here. No, I like that. Again, I, I, li I like that. I think that would be great, and it does. the The building does look like it to me. It looked like the back of a museum. It looked like the back of a. Uh, I mean, like a, maybe like an art studio that had a little coffee shop out front. You know, the paint, it was painted nicely. It had some nice trim. There was a little bit of greenery near it. But yeah, it was, it was, a, it was a good photo. I mean, it, it, it could be in Dallas. It could be in Brooklyn. It could be in Portland. It, it, it seemed very familiar. What if we, we had um, something like many years before like 100 200 years i don't know 300 years and then uh all this great flood happened and then we got divided uh but we uh because there are pyramids like all over the world they're all the same starting from egypt and uh i don't know north america south america so it seems like we've been something bigger than we are now but then we got knocked down a few centuries back are you ever given any thought to this idea Oh, yeah. Well, like the Sumerians had the ziggurats. They're kind of like stair step. And then the Aztecs also have this stair step design pyramids where they were like sacrifice virgins at the top of the pyramid. And then we had the classic pyramids of Egypt. And, you know, I don't know if you've looked at it lately or maybe some of our subscribers can Google the Louvre, L-O-U-V-R-E, the famous museum in Paris, has a pyramid shaped glass a glass pyramid i think it's a design by ie pay oh, very fine with everybody's seen that okay well maybe michael hasn't i don't think mark stevens has but i'm just saying the concept of the pyramid is still very much alive and with us and the pyramid at at the Louvre yeah, well, well, why do, do, you think, do you have any idea why 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 is the pyramid so widespread on a global scale it's an archetypal image of, I think, it's an archetypal image of transcendence. The base is wide, we live on the earth, and as you go up higher, there's a desire to see more, be more, escape this world. I don't know, I just think of it, it as an archetype. I love them. You know what? I told you before, I want to be an architect at some point. And I like the pyramid because they're very stable. You can't actually, like, uh, it's not easy to uh, pull that over. Uh, yeah, it doesn't the tumble over. Is, the, yeah, the base, the base is wide. The base is wide. And also yeah, they have some, some uh, there's some different little pastries. Uh, there's some, you know, different cultures have their bakeries and their pastries and their special designs, you know. But I know that there are some, they're about the, like if you think about the size of your fist, uh, there's this one pastry, I don't even know what it's called in English. It's a Mexican pastry and it's made with, I don't even know what it's called, semolina flour. And then it has like something like honey spread on the top of it. And then it's sprinkled with a little bit of pistachios. It's a really great um and you eat it with like a fork or a knife, but there's even little pyramid. I just, I just had a pistachio with honey this morning and yesterday night as well. Because I really I drank, drank a bit too much two days ago. That was, by the way, I have to admit, <laughs> I'm guilty as charged. And uh, that was the first time I knocked myself out like that in like 20 years, I think. And I thought, uh, <clears throat> never again. And then I, I, I get to wake up every in the middle of the night, second day in a row. And I like, I want apples and uh, pistachio. I don't know. I just keep eating 
I bought myself a, a few kilos. I don't know how much that would be in in pounds. Yeah. Apples and, and I sit. I mean, I used to. I used to sit in the dark with a bottle of Lafrag in my hand. Now I'm surrounded by apples and pistachios. And also, I bought myself honey. I didn't buy it. It just was there already. And I can't no, get enough. No, it's really interesting that you uh, because I posted something somewhere about what kind of ice cream do you like, and um, I Lydia, who's one of our subscribers, I forgot what she said, but somebody else who lives in Germany said that she likes. Uh, salted caramel and then i wrote that i like um uh, pistachio ice cream and then it's strange that you just mentioned that you had pistachio and honey but i also bought some apples the green apples you can slice them and you can put um you can put some olive oil in a pan and put some sugar and like nutmeg on it then you kind of like saute the 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 apple slices and then let it kind of cool off. Then you can put it on top of you know you know ice. you know how we you know how we call them here green apples. I'm not sure if it's the same in the U.S., but uh, it's 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 always it always bugged me. We call them at least if you want to buy them. It says Granny Smith. You ever heard yeah, that's that? That's what they are. Like, that's what they're called. Really? Yeah. I didn't know Granny that. I said, come up with such a strange name for an apple. That's probably the name of the apple. Like you have. The name. Yeah, but that's why and do you have, have the name. same? How is it possible that you have the same Granny Smith that we do? Because that's the name of the apple. Well, for example, if someone says, you know, like Dijon mustard is a the name of a specific type of mustard that comes out of Dijon, France. So if you say, I wonder why they call it Dijon mustard in Moscow and in Paris. Well, because that's the name of it. Okay. I mean, excellent. Okay. Well, I mean, I I always feel like I'm very mean to you. I'm very mean. No, 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 no. Don't, don't, don't feel like that. Because um, uh, first of all, no, I, I know you always, don't. No, the thing is, I generally the 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 Granny Smith apple is too hard for me. Like I don't. I'm not like like some people like to bite on apples. Like they have like a horse mouth. They like to like chomp on apples i like to saute apples i like to put them in oatmeal i like to put raisins and apples in porridge in the in the winter time so i like to use apples in cooking and if i'm going to slice apples very thin like if i get some hummus which is like ground up uh, chickpeas and olive olive oil instead of using chips for the dip, if you want to eat something a little bit healthier, sometimes people will slice up apples so you can kind of dip the apple slice into the hummus. Wow, I'm getting do, hungry. Do you like, do you like <laughs> green apples more or do you prefer some, some sort of red apples? I don't like, I like Gala, G-A-L-A. -A. They're kind of speckled, golden, and red. Not, not solid red. Red apples are too, I don't like the skin on them. And the 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 meat is too mushy. I my favorite apple is Gala G A L A. But I mean, you know, I like to 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 cook with apples. And if someone gave me a bag of Granny Smith, I would not sit and eat them hard and cold. What I would do is I would use them in cooking, or use them to dip something with. Cut them real real thin. Also, I broke off a crown. So uh, I, I don't think. Like Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm saying if I bit into an apple, no, then then you keep you there. keep you keep eating gala apples because it's safer, I think, compared to Granny Smith. Um, well, right now I'm not right? even eating apples. I'm I'm eating pears because I love pears. I actually bought pears, mm. and I'm yeah, I'm I'm actually I'm on to pears right now. Pears are pears, really pears great. or pears. P e a r a pear. I think in mm. Anna Karenin, he tries to bring. Yeah, his that's wife. why I. Asked, that's why I asked. That. I've been confused with the pronunciation. It's it's written pears, but you call you call it pears. No, like um, there's homonyms. P a i r. There's a pair of boots. There's a pair of shoes. There's also the fruit you eat. A pear. P e a r. They're spelled differently. One is spelled P a i r, pair of boots. 
and also the fruit that you eat, P-E-A-R, they're pronounced the same, pear. And then also in French, Why the word pear. pear is not... mm -hmm. Wait a minute. In French, the word pear, P-E-R-E, -E, means father. So Père Lachaise Cemetery is a famous cemetery in Montmartre. But the exact same sound. Père Lachaise, pair of boots. He brought her a pair to try to appease her after his infidelity. Mm. Mm. <laughs> no, it's just like every, everybody, everywhere I look is is all about apple, strawberry, banana, grape. I don't know, but not, there, are, there aren't many pears around except for you know, like in Anna Karenina, uh, Steve was uh, in the first chapter, I guess, when he brought pear to, to his wife and she found about his being infidel, infidel, about his infidelity because he, I, I think he had an affair with French governors and, and, and left note or something. Go figure. And his wife found it. Uh, what, what do you think about that? Well, I think that, you know, men are not as clever as they think they are. <laughs> women can always find out what they're up to. Not because women are looking, because men are careless about their escapades. Wow. Yeah, I mean, but, but it's not, it applies to husbands and wives, to, to spouses, basically, because they always know. They don't have any proof, but they always know. Yeah, especially since their shirt smells like some other woman. <laughs> well, not, even, not even if there is no smell, you, you somehow, they, uh, spouses anyway, they always know, we always know because something's off. The energy, the vibration you give out is different. Yeah, especially if you've been vibrating with someone else. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm just... I'm, <laughs> yeah, I'm no, I don't know how to explain that. Uh, yeah, no, but no, what if you find your soulmate, if you're like, if you're married, okay, and then you found your soulmate, and um, would that be okay to vibrate with him or with her? Because soulmate is not a, like uh, the thing you meet every day. Well, that's something you're going to need to discuss with your confessor no a confessor means your priest i, I no, don't, I think, I I don't, don't know. confess I, I know i know you don't like confess maybe i should have i tried once but there was such a long queue in front of me with <laughs> probably there are lots of sinners in this world and when i was like ready to and uh, time was up time was up and i didn't get to that was one time and i was about to suck to confess and i wasn't lucky yeah well you know i just know that um there's different levels of relationship. Like some people are married and they have a, other little flirtations, a little girl, a girl at the coffee shop or a girl at the watch store or, or a, a woman could be married and flirt with a bartender. So, you know, are those sins? Is it wrong? But, you know, if you're leaving every day to go to the same shop every single day to see this one girl and Generally, your wife is trying to call you, but you're never in the office. And the secretary says, oh, he's just stepped out. Oh, he's just stepped out. Oh, he's just stepped out. The wife would figure out you have not just stepped out for a coffee. Something else is going on. So there's these patterns, I think. I'm just making this up as, I'm, as we're talking because I'm an extrovert. I think while talking. But I don't, I don't know. I mean, I just think... Uh, the frequency and the intent of your heart. Like if you're desperately trying to text someone and they're not answering and you're in some sort of relationship with them, then that's one thing. Or if you're just casually stopping by a coffee shop for the second time and kind of smiling at the girl fixing your coffee, well, then, you know, that might not be too bad. But uh, yeah, I think it's very, diff it's hard to understand what faithfulness means. Like, I'm not married and I have various escapades or adventures and, you know, some I don't feel very good about, some I do feel good about. I don't know. It's it's a weird world. It's a strange world. Yeah, no, no, I, uh, I feel like I need a confession. I feel like a confession too, cause to, cause to, <laughs> to admit my wrongdoings. To, to I I, I, you know, acknowledge my guilt and uh, and also that get that nasty secrets off my chest. But the, it's easier for you because uh, you're a woman. A woman are not to be blamed for their sins, or at least not as hard as men gets. Because 
um, because uh, they're women, right? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. First of all, I would just like to say that that in traditional Catholic teaching, you know, I grew up with traditional Catholic teaching. You have to confess your sins and have a desire to change your heart and behavior and then accept your penance. So let me just go over that. The penance might be the priest might say, well, go sit in the church and say three Hail Marys. Or the priest might say, well, go sit in the church and look at look at the statue of Mary. Or the priest might say, why don't you start trying to read your Bible a little bit every day? So the different priests will give you your penance. And the penance is supposed to be some way to remind you that you've been to confession. So you have the penance. Okay, then you have the backing it up, the desire to change your behavior and change your heart. And then the first step is just showing up to confess. So showing up to confess means you look at the schedule, you see at four o'clock, they're having confessions at St. Thomas Aquinas Church. You go there, you wait behind three people, and then you sit down. Or like you went someplace, you waited behind a bunch of people, you got frustrated and you left. So the three parts are show up, intend, confess, intend to have a change of heart and behavior, and then accept your pen penance. Okay, the penance is always easy for me. I can like knock out penances easily. The part that's difficult for me as a person of conscience, that means I'm actually thinking about what I'm doing. I'm, I have a conscience that tells me I've done something wrong with knowledge, conscience, I have a consciousness, which means I'm aware that I'm doing something wrong, but I have no intent of changing my behavior. That's what's keeping me from going to confession. I have no intention of changing my behavior about something I have going on with a married guy. Maybe I've never met him. Maybe we've never met up, but it's some sort of an um, emotional attachment to somebody that is inappropriate. So it doesn't have to be like jumping into bed. It can be a part of an emotional attachment that is, it's not ordered. It is not ordered by God. It is a disordered attachment. So if I can't even agree that I want to change my behavior, what is the point of showing up? So if I go to confession, I've actually been thinking about going because I've been in a long time maybe a couple of years. If I'm not, so if I show up and I start talking like that, what do you think the priest is going to say? Hold on there, girl. You know? No, he, he, would, he, would, have probably, he would have probably said something like, that, don't worry, because uh, you're just as broken as the rest of us. So Lord be yeah, with you. Yes, exactly. No, I uh, I'm sad and upset. <laughs> I'm also sad, and we we like being sad together, and with our subscribers who are also sad. <laughs> some are working at night, some are trapped at home, some don't have electricity. I don't know. I don't know. Okay, I don't... Let's, wrap it up. let's wrap it up because uh, I can't go on any longer. I have to think um, how to. Why would I? I mean, what would it take? I, I don't know, but uh, I have to fight these feelings of being sad okay. and upset. Okay. Because they, okay, they well... come from the enemy, I think, and fight them. Yes. Uh, the enemy, I mean, Satan. Because that, that's all. That's the true. Has. And also rationalization. What kind of an elaborate rationalization scheme do I have going on in my head? Yeah. To prevent me from receiving God's mercy and maybe a little bit of wisdom from whatever priest I've never talked to yet. Maybe you're just a computer program. Uh, oh no! So I'm no, I'm not. A, not not a computer program. I'm. I'd, I don't uh, know. I mean, it's for GPT chat or what's that 
named, I don't know, you can't even recognize, can't tell the difference between talking to a person and talking to that artificial intelligence. And there's Alexa, uh, I guess in the US, yeah, it's Amazon, I guess it's sold on Amazon. No, they have yet, yeah, huh? Alexa and Siri, they have everything. I've, I've been in They're getting quite a better every day, exactly. They're better than humans. I don't know. I mean, I've been into um, houses in Portland. I've been into houses in um, in Dallas where it's it's I call it a smart house or a wired house. It has a camera as you enter. It records people moving through the rooms. You can say uh, turn on the coffee at 8 a.m. Um, and you wake up in the morning like, wow, the coffee's there. Like I woke up in Portland, the coffee was ready. And I wonder if if the family, if my daughter had put it on or her husband, I asked her, I said, well, who put on the coffee? He said, oh, well, we have like, it, it's on the, it's, it's on our program. So there's a program, <laughs> there's a program. Also, they have like when they don't have enough chocolate or when oh, they don't have enough. Yeah, you, you are computer program. Yeah, I'm not. No, I am not. I have my bill. I have my bill. I'm holding on to my bill, and I'm now going yeah, to... I've, I've had a fetish for computer programs. Um, yeah. Okay, but you ring your bell. That's all we'll discuss. Wait a minute. Okay. So come back for more exciting fun with Patroma Therapy. Goodbye for I, now. I felt good to finally admit it. <laughs>